Hello everyone and welcome to ACAD 02 which is going to be an introduction to aeronautics and having a look at things from the pilot's perspective. So with this we will be looking at the factors influencing pilots who are receiving air traffic services and the specific challenges they may face. So before we get started Let's just have a think that flying is very different to controlling and pilots typically face quite complex situations which can induce an extremely high workload, especially in the single pilot aircraft that we see a lot of in DCS. And to be able to help pilots to the greatest extent possible. As controllers, we should have an understanding of these situations. So let's talk about phases of flight. We have eight that are typically uh, used. First, we have the aircraft startup, then their taxi, then they take off. They climb up to whatever level they're going to. Then on a ferry flight, they have their cruise portion. Or if they're on a sortie, they would conduct their mission. Then they descend back down. They ap approach an airfield and start an approach into that airfield. And then they land at that aircraft, that airfield even. And then quite often they will taxi back into parking and shut down. But those two phases of flight are a bit less relevant to us. So firstly, the startup. There are typically lots of steps that are run through and lots of checklists that are run and the pilots are typically checking and running through lots of different things. So during this phase, the pilot will typically, will typically check the ATIS or Automated Terminal Information Service. This is quite often done before they contact their first controller, either the Ground Movement Controller or GMC or Ground Movement Planner or GMP, which we will discuss in more detail in ACAD 7 and 8. Uh, although startup clearance from the ground movement controller is typically rarely required. And during this time, they may also be coordinating with the rest of their flight and finalizing their mission plan. Workload-wise, it is reasonably high workload, where aircraft are checking all their aircraft systems, checking all their everything necessary for their mission, and making sure their radios are functioning. They might be receiving flight clearances, or just generally preparing to receive taxi clearances and departure instructions, and so on. The pilots will have lots of checklists, checklists to run and may be required to make last minute changes to, for example, their loadout or fuel load. So how can we help as controllers? So generally, and this goes for any phase of flight, we want to avoid overloading pilots with information. During the startup phase specifically, we typically want the pilots to contact us whenever they are ready, and also being able to clarify in plain English when necessary and not rushing them into a taxi. Speaking of which, the 
taxi phase of flight. So before taxi, the pilot typically requests their IFR or VFR flight clearance, and then their taxi clearance. The pilots could also request progressive taxis at this point, which is slightly more workload intensive for the controller. Then pilots will typically slot into an end of runway position or an EOR and perform their weapon checks there before departure. And the taxi phase of flight can also be a good time to verify the operation of the aircraft's transponders if not done already uh, during startup. The workload at uh, during taxi can change massively. At smaller, simpler aerodromes, it can be very trivial. But at larger, uh, more complex aerodromes, can be quite challenging. Checks are typically done at the runway threshold rather than during taxi so that pilots can focus on their taxi. And if they are part of flights, there could be some light coordination going on between the pilots. So how we can help as controllers is fairly simple. If a pilot is obviously struggling or not really following the instructions, you can repeat them and also use plain English or use a progressive taxi where you effectively become the pilot's satnav. And it's also better to clarify concerns or questions that a pilot may have before they depart rather than once they are in the air, once things become uh, very busy. Moving on to takeoff. Pilots who are in a formation will be busy coordinating and planning their takeoff on their own intraflight frequency. And once we have cleared an aircraft to take off, uh, we want to minimize communications to that aircraft unless a risk exists. So don't talk to them unless you absolutely have to. Fast jets in typical fashion will climb quickly, so you can expect a high climb rate and high acceleration, especially if no specific standard instrument departure or SID is given to them, which we will discuss more in ACAD 7. During the takeoff, there is extremely high workload, so pilots have to be very attentive, especially if taking off in formation. And because of this, pilots could be unable to effectively communicate with you until they are airborne and have settled into their climb a bit more. And therefore, pilots should be given some time to climb and stabilize their formations before you give them more instructions. So how can we help? Long story short, we want to minimize communications to the aircraft. We can still talk to other aircraft as necessary. But to the aircraft that are taking off, we typically want to minimize communications as much as possible. And once they have just taken off, we want to give the pilot some time to stabilize their aircraft and their formation 
and therefore just being a bit more patient when waiting for read banks. If pilots are, if pilots abort a takeoff or reject that takeoff, they will probably focus on getting their aircraft stopped safely before communicating it to you. There's these three words will come up quite a lot today. They are the pilot's priorities. Aviate first, then navigate, and then communicate. We have to remember that a pilot's um, that communicating with the controller is a pilot's lowest priority. They want to aviate, i.e. fly their plane and ensure their plane is safe first. Then they want to figure out where they are and where they're going. And lastly, they want to tell someone about it, specifically you, the controller. During the climb, the pilots then begin, the pilots will climb to their clear level following their route. Um, the climb rate specifically will depend on the payload of the aircraft and how quickly they need to climb specifically and the specific aircraft. Workload during the climb is typically low. They may uh, use the autopilot functionality and even if they don't do that, hand flying a steady climb, especially in modern aircraft, is fairly trivial. And pilots might not need to fence in during their climb but they may choose to. And fencing is just making sure that the aircraft is ready for combat, but does not specifically imply their master arm switch goes to arm. So how can we help? We typically want to monitor flights just to make sure they are following their instructions correctly. This is also a very low workload phase of flight for us, the controller. We could give them directs or shortcuts, potentially vectoring them around weather or traffic. And with that, we would also potentially provide delay updates if it's relevant to them. So, the cruise and or mission. During ferry flights, the cruise is very low workload and there is not much to do. You are effectively flying in a straight line with the occasional turn. The tactical mission side of it is far more complex, can be a high workload, and is the job of the tactical control arm, which is far outside of ATSA's scope. So workload during the cruise specifically is very low. Pilots could be checking their approach charts and preparing for the descent or approach, or potentially briefing things among their flight. However, during missions, they are the workload tends to be very high, but that is not covered by us. So, what we would tend to give with uh, during the cruise is just reminding pilots of arrival procedures to expect, standard arrival routes, or however else things happen to be functioning at that point. And we would also want to coordinate with the tactical agencies to efficiently manage the returning aircraft. <laughs>
Next we have the descent. In fast jets, descents can be flown at high speeds, which will typically cause a rapid descent rate. During this, flight leads can be planning the approach and looking at their different charts and briefing this to their flight members. So typically this will be a more medium workload. During this, the pilots will be finalizing their approach plans, looking at the missed approach procedures and things like that. The workload during this time is typically higher for the controller, as we will typically be vectoring aircraft um, onto an approach, and the pilots simply have to follow these restrictions or the vectors. Generally, all we can do to help aircraft as controllers is to communicate issues and instructions clearly and expeditiously when possible. Then moving on to the approach. During the approach, pilots will typically be quite attentive and focused, especially during an instrument approach. And pilots on instrument approaches, if we remember back to Aviate, Navigate, Communicate, they will be aviating first and then will communicate to you wherever possible. Workload during the approach is quite variable. If they are on an instrument approach in single pilot fast jets, the workload is typically very high as they will typically be hand flying the approach. During any approach, be it visual or instrument, the terminal phase will always be quite high as they are focusing on looking outside, looking at the runway, while still making sure they are within certain parameters. If they are on a visual approach, the workload is typically relatively high, as they are able to look outside and gain a more intuitive understanding of where their aircraft is, and where they have to fly their plane, effectively. So during the approach phase, as controllers we typically want to keep communications fairly succinct and to only transmit when necessary and on also only giving the necessary clearances or traffic information that is actually relevant to the pilot. During this phase, we typically want to avoid asking too many questions of the pilots, as the pilots should be focusing on compliance with the approach and with specific restrictions on that approach. Now let's look at the landing phase. The landing phase is closely linked with the approach as it immediately follows it and is typically relatively short. So no matter the type of approach, pilots will typically be focusing on managing their energy, which is how we describe airspeed and altitude together, and efficiently being able to land every aircraft in their flight. Workload during landing is typically quite high, as a pilot is focusing on lots of different things simultaneously. Making sure their, the elements of their flight are doing what they've been told, managing their own energy, flaring, braking, vacating the runway, and then finally communicating to air traffic control. <laughs> 
So how can we help? Uh, if aircrafts are in the uh, landing pattern, we want to monitor them fairly closely, as pilots can sometimes get tunnel visioned on their own aircraft, and therefore be blind to potential risks and conflicts. However, we do still want to avoid communicating unnecessarily as to try and not add to the pilot's workload. And flights will be coordinating quite heavily on their intraflight frequencies, so especially during more complex landing procedures, say again, can be quite commonly used. Finally, let's talk about emergencies. We want to remember Murphy's Law, in that anything that can go wrong probably will go wrong. Again, reiterating the big three, pilots will typically be following the following steps in an emergency. They will first be aviating, keeping the plane in the air and keeping it flying. This would also involve identifying the emergency, applying the appropriate checklists and procedures to keep the aircraft in the air and under control, ideally. Then they will be navigating, so identifying a safe place for them to land, be that an, uh, a runway or be that the field that they have at their two o'clock. And as part of this, they also want to figure out their own location as best as possible. And only once they have done that will they communicate with the controllers, typically with the words mayday, 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 or potentially pan, 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 and inform you of their intentions. So during all of this, communicating is the lowest priority. As a controller, you typically want to clear um, any conflicts um, out of, or clear any other aircraft out of the way to reduce conflicts for the pilot, and just to try and reduce the pilot's workload as much as possible. This could include taking over more of their navigation responsibilities to uh, remove some workload from the pilot. And it's also worth remembering that the workload in a single pilot aircraft is high enough and this workload becomes far higher in a fast jet where everything happens very quickly. So to summarize this, we spoke about the different phases of flight and the primary ones that we look at as a controller. We also spoke about the pilot's workload in these different phases of flight and had a look at them in a bit more detail. We spoke about how a controller can avoid increasing pilot workload and specifically not transmitting to pilots in very high workload phases of flight, except in specific cases of emergency. We also spoke about the big three, aviate, navigate, communicate, which I cannot drill into you enough and remembering that communicating should generally be the lowest priority for a pilot. Then we also spoke briefly about how we can assist a pilot in emergency situations, a, what a pilot's workload in emergencies could look like, and how we can try and help as best we can.